Hi, it's Todd from Todd's Workshop and Todd Cutler here and... Matt Easton of Scholar Glow Victoria. So it's been two or three years since we did the last video together, so Long felt time. it was about time. Yeah, um, and thanks yeah. for having me over. It's, no, it's a it, pleasure. It's great to be over here again, and I'm obviously watching your channel regularly, so I still feel spiritually like oh, I've uh, lovely. seen you plenty. But. Thank you. But the reason Matt's really here, other than the flattery, thank you very much, <laughs> uh, is I've made two swords which are unusual. And, you know, I'm good at making swords, or at least I like to think so. I'm not so good at using them. Matt, on the other hand, he can use a sword. <laughs> so uh, he's not seen them. So the first up, is I'll show you this baby, is a Swiss Sabre. There we go. It's a monster. Matt, take her away. Right, so the um, first thing I have to say about this Sabre is obviously the original is in uh, the Wallace Collection. Yep. I grew up knowing this sword uh, from Wall uh, pretty much the Wallace Collection, going to the Wallace Collection as a kid, I grew up in London, was one of my first kind of hooks, I guess, to getting addicted to mm. arms and armour. So it, it's amazing to see it you know, recreated, I suppose. And also, of course, I know that you've um, been to the Wallace Collection in the past, haven't you? Yeah, and yeah. compared ones you've made of these, so. Yeah, that, that was a really interesting process, putting the one that I originally made next yeah. to the original original. Yeah, and obviously um, these are all handmade, so is this very similar to that one? Are there any slight differences? Uh, well, I must confess, I can't actually remember fully the answer to that question. Yeah. Yes, there are differences, I know there were. What's interesting about making a replica like that is when the guy made the Swiss Sabre originally, made the sword originally, he just made a sword and he made it kind of in this style and the new flashy Swiss Sabre style and that's what he made. What he didn't do was go there measuring every single component piece. And so the way I try to work is in that spirit that I try to make something similar to the thing I'm seeing. Mm. But what I don't do so much of is just measuring exactly because then my interest goes and the spirit of the piece goes, I think. And I, I mean, I suppose the original maker of that original example in the Wallace Collection, if he made 20 of those a year, they all would have been different. Yeah. Um, they yeah. may not have even had exactly the same arrangement of bars or, you know, they certainly no. would have felt the same in the hand. But yeah, so I mean, the, I suppose the characteristic thing to note about this, well, we'll I guess look at the blade in a second, but about the hilt. But it is a basket hilt, isn't yeah. it? And that's the weird thing, isn't it? A basket hilt with a long sword. And I think a lot of people don't realise that there are basket hilted long mm. swords. Well, that, to be honest, that's one of the main reasons that um, I've asked you over, actually, is because... Mm. I find this thing very intriguing because it's clearly it is a hand and a half or a two-hander. Mm -hmm. That's clearly what it is. Mm -hmm. and, and yet my understanding of sword fighting techniques will make that rather difficult with a basket. So how does this work? So you do get long swords which have a basket on just the first half mm. of, the, of the grip, as it were, or first half of the hilt. And you were saying on Swiss sabres that tends to be tends to be the way they are. Usually. Well, as far as I've seen, so I mean, there's quite a lot of variety and, and these Swiss Sabres, which as we call them now, but uh, at the time uh, they, I think they were called a Schnepf or something like that, which uh, possibly alludes to a bird's beak. Um, so the term Swiss Sabre is quite a modern uh, term, but they do have an association or they seem to have been popular, should we mm. say, in Switzerland. But they were certainly used in other areas as well, I think, uh, Germany and, and, and Austria. But certainly when we're looking at long swords, which have complex hilts, Usually, uh, the complex hilts am amount to sidebars and finger rings uh, and the, the bar on the side which sort of protects your thumb. Usually, we don't have further basket down here because it can interfere with the grip yeah. of the two-handed grip. But that being said, there, are, there is a family of complex hilted longswords where you have a basket around the lead hand. Now, why it only covers the lead hand uh, is open to interpretation and opinion so i've always assumed if you're on horseback using it as a one-handed sword you've now got a basket yeah. hilt around your lead hand which is a good thing to have possibly you could also argue that the lead hand is more vulnerable and that's certainly true in longsword fencing we get hit far more in the um, lead hand which for me would be my right hand uh, than you would in your uh, rearmost hand because it's nearer to the opponent's blade it's I'm, nearer the cross i'm going to stop you <laughs> wow that's a bit nice that's very, very nice. It's got beautiful distal tape on it, so it feels really lively in the hand. It, it is about 40 or 50 grams lighter than the original was, it must be okay. said. Okay. But it's, it is very difficult when you are even working from measurements, but it's very difficult unless the piece is actually on your bench mm. to nail every as aspect perfectly. It is that classic, you know, sabery type thing that it's starting about nine mil thick at the hilt mm -hmm. and then comes right down. So, I mean, at the end here, you know, it's, it's sort of two millish. I mean, mm. it might even be less, I can't remember. So 
you can demonstrate that quite nicely just by flexing it. And you can see how the first half of the blade stays stiff and straight and all of the flex pretty much happens in the second half, a bit like a bow limb. Um, and that's got mechanically good advantages for fencing because when you bind against an opponent's blade, it means that you've got a lot of um, stiffness and stability in the first half of the blade, which uh, increases your ability to uh, bind through and push through against an opponent's blade and thrust them, for example. But also it means that a sword handles really nicely because by taking your mass, your given mass, and having it down, back down nearer the hand, it means that that bit that's far from your hand, which requires more energy to move around, mm. is lighter. The other thing to mention, of course, is by being thinner up here, you've got a thinner cross section, which is therefore better at passing through flesh or whatever you're cutting through to tummy mats or anything else because it's thinner. Um, so it's got all of the, you know, distal taper, as, as I call it anyway, it has got all of the good advantages. It makes the sword feel better. It makes it handle better. The only slight disadvantage, arguably, is, is a flexible blade uh, is less forgiving in the thrust if you meet a resistant mm. target. Yeah. So if we look at swords which are specialised for thrusting through mail, for example, or indeed daggers like mm. your rondel daggers, they have to be very, very stiff. Yeah. And this t therefore tells us something about this blade. This isn't like type 17 or type 15 mm. thrusting long swords that you'd find in the 14th century for stabbing into male gussets and stuff. Yeah. It's a sword that's very much a cut and thrust blade, isn't yeah. it? It's oh, a sabre. I mean, you know, you can, you can see from that, I mean, it's not against armour, it just, it just isn't. It? Yeah. And, and I mean, focusing on the blade as well, it's a very, very interesting design and quite a new, relatively new design to most people in most parts of Europe at this time. It is a sabre blade, which looks like later period sabre mm. blades in many ways. And it's got this raised full sedge or yelman. Yeah, I, I mean, again, that's quite, quite interesting. I mean, if, if I look at the blade myself and in my head, this is always a curved blade. Mm. And it is actually, but if you put a straight edge on it, it's mm. not very much at all. No, it really isn't. Yeah. And but it, it reads, visually it reads as a curved blade, I think. So there's maybe three things to look at here. I think one is the cultural uh, influence. Mm -hmm. And so when we get into the 16th century, and this is from the first half of the 16th century. And when we get into the 16th century, we have a lot of Ottoman Turkish influence coming yeah. into fashion, weapons, all sorts of things. And um, I think, uh, we, there's a secondary thing for that as well in, in that there's particularly in central and eastern europe there is the saber is growing in popularity which itself is also partly related to the spread of the mm. ottoman turkish empire so bearing in mind if this is from switzerland that's next to the austro-hungarian empire yeah. basically so hungarian sabers are influencing the so if we call them native kind of mesa and mm. falchion type swords leading to what we would now call the dusak but we also have to bear in mind that sabres um, with uh, somewhat curved blades, slightly curved blades of this kind, had actually been in Europe way, way earlier, back in the uh, 700s, um, in uh, 7 and 800s. Really? Early, early sabres, yeah, appear um, at the eastern edges of the Carolingian Empire. And so one of the swords associated with Charlemagne is actually an early sabre. So, Matt, what are your thoughts on this? I mean, swing it around a little bit. Tell me how how it feels because I've pondered that grip you know how it works because it's not a two hand it's not it's not hand and a half grip on a regular sword so it's it's not a particularly long grip for the length of the blade uh, the blade doesn't feel at all unwieldy because it's got a really good distal taper in it so it feels so quite the whole piece is relatively light yeah it's, uh, at one and a half kilos so three okay. and a half pounds ish okay yeah and but it is quite um it's quite a small grip for me um, and because of the angle that the knuckle bow meets the pommel at, it does restrict some of the motions I can go through. Um, so for example, if I was to um, try and do a uh, scheitel howl, that's fine. I can lift the hands up. So a conventional uh, cut, which is coming at this kind of angle, no problem at all. If I were to try and come over someone's guard to hit them on the top of the head uh, with something called a scheitel howl um, or scheitel, and then the Starts knuckle bow does you. start to create a hotspot, a bit of a kind of bind on the hand. If we're using the false edge for something like a zvirch, um, we can do it, but again, because I have to rotate my left hand around the bottom of mm. the grip, it starts to collide with that knuckle bow. In regards to the, um, the finger ring at the front, mm. I can put my finger over there, uh, but what I do find is my first yeah. knuckle on my right hand gets a bit jammed into that side ring. 
So if I wanted to use that finger ring, I'd want the side ring to be a bit bigger. Yeah. I mean, l looking at it from this angle, my first reaction would be, and I might have made a mistake, my first reaction would be, well, the original probably wasn't like that, but I'm actually looking at it from here, and, and I think the original pretty much was like that. I can't see how you could get your finger through there unmolested. And the no. other thing we have to say is in this period, you know, finger rings became very standard. Uh, complex hilts of various sorts um, were in vogue, and they, most of them have a form of finger ring on there. And I don't think all of them were intended yeah. to be used. <laughs> Sometimes we find the blades too wide and it's blocking the fingering. Sometimes just the placement of the fingering. Even basket, British basket hilts, early basket hilts, where you can't physically get your finger through, have a it's finger ring. Yeah. <laughs> so I do think there was a degree of convention in there as well. Yeah. People thought, oh, we've got to have a finger ring on it, even if it wasn't actually functional. Yeah, coming, coming into the Renaissance, you might imagine that they got over that. You know, mm. it's a time of education and learning, but they still seem to do it just putting weird things in but we still do we still have flares yeah <laughs> yeah 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 but yeah it's interesting in terms of the guard positions um so going through the low guards all around uh, it doesn't really make having the basket there doesn't really make any difference to any of those the medium guards long short in my system by corno doesn't make any difference to the um so in the system i teach from which is italian uh finestra we can do that absolutely happily um, with this type of hilt. So, and I do think the fact that we've got such a deliberate big false edge on this sword does imply that it was intended to be used with the false edge mm. in various ways. Um, it, it, every time I make that blade, I do find the false edge surprisingly long. I have to recheck my drawings to yeah. see if I got it right. But and to me, that implies someone wanted a sabre that they could use kind of like a long sword. So, right. so someone who perhaps previously had mm. had a double-edged sword so they still you know if you're cutting with the false edge you're really only cutting up here anyway the rest of it yeah. is superfluous i do find there's a little bit of a hot spot in this mm. um angle in here so if i was getting this sword made for me i would change the angle slightly that that knuckle bone met the pommel yeah. at so it came up less shallow and a little yeah. bit more so, outwards yeah, so yeah, no, I get because it. just that little change would give a lot more mm. uh, rotational potential to that bottom hand, um, which is, I think, fairly important when it's quite a short grip. Mm. That being said, I do wonder if this was also intended to be used quite a lot as a one-handed sword. It Perhaps feels like back. it could be, yeah. Beca because, yeah. Uh, and that was a question I was going to ask, because yeah. the weight would allow it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, even though it looks like a monster, it, it's not. No, it's, it's, um, it's not a light sword, but it, it moves quick enough. And especially if you're on horseback. So if this belonged to someone who they want a long sword on foot, but they spend most of their time on horseback, mm. then absolutely on horseback, you've got good reach for delivering the point. Um, it's easily wield, wieldable enough to, to cut from and recover. And importantly, it makes swishing noises when you move it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think, you know, with modern training weapons and uh, reenactment weapons, the, the mentality de behind designing a hilt is that it should last for years of recreational bashing. Yeah. Whereas the real sharp swords, it wasn't you, might only, you might only use them once or twice mm. in earnest, mm. and if they got damaged, you get them fixed, yeah. or you get a new hilt, you know. Um, well, it's actually, you know what, I'm just going to bring something out and show you, because okay. this is an uh, interesting point. We were just talking about comfort. And this is actually going to the same customer as that. He's bought it as part of the same set. And it's dated around about the same time, actually. Uh, Holbein dagger. But the thing about this, let me just grab that. But the thing about it is it is about show. And that's what you're just saying. It's really, he gets that out maybe once a month, once every two months to use it or threaten it or whatever it is if he <laughs> lives a hard life. Otherwise, it stays in the scabbard all his life looking darn good. And that's, it's a real knife. Mm. But it is presumably, mostly its function is just to look swanky as anything. I think there's also an element as well about um, grip retention. And I think sometimes in the modern world, soft-handed people like something yeah. to be super, super comfortable. And they don't necessarily think about the fact that when you're covered in blood and sweat and mm. fighting for your life, you need something to just stay yeah. in your hand. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's like that studied, studied grip rondel that I do yeah. on the Todd Cutler line. Comfort? No. Yeah. Do you know it's in your hand when you're holding it? Yeah. Yes, you do. Especially if you're wearing gauntlets yeah. or you know, gloves of any kind. And I mean, I, I actually, if 
find that quite comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, absolutely. Like you say, there, there is a difference between something for wearing, mm. something for using, and there's always an interplay between those priorities. It's, it's not a hammer that you use for six hours, eight hours a day, no. you know. No. Um, Looking good, Matt. <laughs> yeah, so this will definitely cut. Um, it's a lovely cutter, actually. Very, very smooth. Um, it tracks beautifully. One of the details I love, actually, about this and something I, I always look for in, uh, in my swords is a relatively flat grip. Really helps with indexing the edge. Yeah. Yeah. And I especially find that's important if you've got any kind of complex hilt because there's a degree of asymmetry uh, in the balance to a, to a complex hilt. So having that flat grip, very, very nice. I must confess it's a shorter grip than I'm used to and that takes some uh, adapting to and you kind of you want to keep the hands quite close together which I know some people prefer to do anyway. I'm personally used to having my hand further down at the mm. pommel end which I can't do because of the basket yeah. hilt here so I have to modify how I hold the sword. It actually makes the grip a little bit more similar to Japanese um, grip on a sword but lining up the uh, wrists and the knuckles keeping the hands close together and it tracks beautifully through the target. It's very light and nimble in the tip, very little resistance going through the target because of the cross section. It's thin mm. and because it's got quite a lenticular um, uh, curve to the, to the cutting uh, gradient. It's very, very smooth through the target. Yeah, feels absolutely lovely. I can see why uh, in Switzerland, sabers and, you know, disax and derivatives of them got more and more popular right the way through the 16th century and even you know into the 17th century um, because they're very good cutters, they handle very well and they do what they're supposed to do. Um, cool. Right, but before we put this one away, Matt, mm. is I'd like to show you the scabbard because the shape here was um, one that came from Bern Museum, the copy came from Bern Museum. Ah. And I've not seen a shape on a Swiss Sabre scabbard before, so I love that. But it was, it, it was Roland um, Vorchecker who sent mm. me the, the photos of it and the link. So thank you very much, Roland, that was great. But I just love that's what, 25 centimetres, eight inches, something mm. like that, coming up the fore mm. of the scabbard. And I just, for me, it's just a really, I'll grab the sword, really yeah. nice uh, way so, to finish the end of it. Yeah, and so, so in, in many ways, if you, if you just look at the top half of the scabbard, it's a bit like a longsword scabbard of the time, isn't it? Mm. Um, it? It's in the same way that the hilt of that is similar in construction to many longsword hilts. But by necessity that shape has to be a different yeah. design doesn't it to yeah. accommodate that that different shape of tip and it's really um individual and, and, well, I've and different i've not seen i've not yeah. seen the like of it but i mean it makes sense but yeah it, it's funny because in a way it looks it, it looks historical but it it almost looks like some fantasy designs doesn't it where people have designed scimitars or whatever and they yeah. have to have a shape design well, it's, it's so. interesting on the original one the end the finial here actually sort of flicks up almost around a corner oh, right. and um I, I sort of didn't nail that detail on it. It's it's Funny quite thing. it's it's very artistic and it's very individual. I really really like it, um, and and I also like the detail that it's longer on the the mm. sort of main cutting edge than on the false edge, mm. because that's where there's going to be the most friction and sort of dragging and knocking. Uh, yeah, and where the yeah. point might dig into the wood on the inside. So it's it's got a functional reason for that mm. particular di design. But yeah, right. Let's put this thing away, and uh, Matt, it has been. An absolute pleasure. Yeah, well, thanks we a lot. We can do that now. Thanks, yeah. And, and uh, <laughs> at last. Thank you very much. But I've got a starter. You want to come back for that one? Yeah, yeah. Definitely come Let's back for a starter. Right. <laughs>